Good morning. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. And we have an awesome group of fathers. If you did not receive your Father's Day gift, uh, Christy, grab somebody to hand them out. Put your hand up if you did not receive your Father's Day gift. We've got an awesome pen that actually scrolls through scripture as you click it. So I don't know if you really ever even want to write with this, but I would just sit here and read it. <laughs> and it's red, which is a good thing. <clears throat> I find it ironic um, that we have been working through a series on spiritual warfare. How many of you have had, had a really good week? Yeah. <laughs> we had a good end to the week. And we were, it was a good because it ended. Um, actually, I, I let my guard down. Uh, we were geared up for war on Sunday because Sunday afternoon and evening seems to be the days that we get hit. Um, had a good Sunday. Monday was going well. Monday evening came. I relaxed and got blasted. And it lasted for about a day and a half. And because I'm, I'm not a very quick study, it took me that long to realize what was going on. And uh, we were engaged in spiritual warfare. Actually, we were more getting bowled over in spiritual warfare. Um, but once we figured out what was going on and got our feet under us, <clears throat> actually I guess got our knees under us, uh, things started turning around. And I find it ironic that last week's message was recorded with no audio. So for those of you that want to have last week's message, I hope you read lips. Um, but we are not actually dealing with spiritual warfare per se today because it's Father's Day. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about fathers. We all have them. <clears throat> um, biologically, we all have a father, but spiritually, we all have a father. That is the model for every man to aspire to be that wants to have children. Okay? Um, I was reading <clears throat> some things online and I came across this story, someone asked the little boy to define Father's Day. What is Father's Day? And he replied, well, it's just like Mother's Day, except you don't have to buy as expensive a gift. <laughs> I think that might be true. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. <clears throat> um, today we celebrate fathers. Um, I have to tell you, our society and our culture does everything it can to denigrate fathers, to count them of little cost and little value. Uh, I, I don't watch television anymore, um, but the last that I did, I could not recall a single TV show where the fathers were esteemed, where they were held with honor. They were sometimes laughably lovable, oftentimes foolish. Um, commercials depict men as narrow-minded or ignorant or just stupid. Um, our culture has striven very hard to make fatherhood out to be of no account. Um, for any of you that have watched the movie Courageous, at the beginning of the movie they throw out some statistics about the, the impact that a male figure has, that a father figure has in the home. Now I don't, I'm not going to try and quote the statistics, but I know that the large portion of prisoners in jail today come from broken families. Okay? Um, we have juvenile delinquency on the rise that uh, homes, uh, ironically enough, 
you can watch the trend as the divorce rate climbs, so does the juvenile delinquency rate, almost step for step. We have uh, teenage pregnancy on the rise. We have uh, kids that are looking for something that they're not getting at home. Now, fathers, God has called and appointed you to a role that no one else can fill. He has ordained the structure of the family after his own heart. He is referred to as our Holy Father. He sent his son. And I believe it is incumbent on the church, it is the church's responsibility to esteem fathers, to establish, to reestablish the validity of godly fatherhood as something to be aspired to. I understand full well that some of us did not have great earthly fathers. Some of us had horrific examples of fatherhood. Some of you have shared stories with me that, that make me cringe. That's not what a father is supposed to be. Okay, In our church, in this fellowship, I have seen godly men striving against the oppression that this culture and society gives to be godly examples to their children. I listen to some of the things that you guys do in your homes and I am honored by the zeal with which you have taken up fatherhood. I'm amazed at some of the things that you guys are willing to sacrifice and the things that you commit to rearing your children in godly fashion training them up in the way that they should go so they will not depart. God honors you. God esteems you. God is pleased with you. God desires more from you. Today, the United States has chosen to celebrate fathers. I hated going to church on Father's Day. I, I really did. For years, I wouldn't go. As a matter of fact, when we first started coming to this church, I would not come to church on Father's Day. Because Mother's Day, mothers were esteemed, and rightfully so, and they were held up as... as people of honor, in position, positions to be honored. But Father's Day was a day for the pastor to unleash his full fury on men. And every message was an exhortation. Do more! Do better! Step up! That's garbage. You may need to step up. You may need to do more. But today is not the day to remind you of that. Today, we honor you. We want to encourage you. We want to bless you. Because being a father is not an easy task. Being a godly father is oftentimes well beyond our strength and our abilities. So what does Scripture say? I'm actually going to take a passage here. This is one of my life verses, so you guys can already turn to Philippians chapter 4. Because I want to talk to you about the view we should have of our fathers today. Okay, so Philippians chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 8. Philippians chapter 4 is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Um... Verse 8 is one of my life verses. Okay? Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, 
If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now that's, that's a broad application, but today I'm going to narrow the focus. As we celebrate fathers today, I want you to apply this verse to your image of your father. Okay? I want you to apply this to your father. So when you think of your father, instead of thinking about the ways he may have messed up, or the ways he didn't do what he should have done, or did do what he shouldn't have done, set those aside. Alright? Take all of that, put it in this mental plastic garbage bag, seal it, tie it, throw it out. Alright? Today, when you think of your father, I want you to think whatever is true. Now, God isn't telling you to paint, to paint a false picture of your father. Okay? But think of what is true. Well, i got to open the bag to look at... No, 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 no. Because we're going to keep reading. And okay? we don't stop there. Whatever is honorable. So you can keep the bag tied. You can keep it shut. Whatever is just. Whatever is pure. Whatever is lovely. Whatever is commendable. Now, um, I've shared some stories about my, my own father. He, he passed away a little over a year ago. Um, my dad uh, came from a, a broken family. Um, he raised his kids according to what the Navy taught him. Okay, so yeah, we, we would have the, the white glove test on Saturdays and, and dad would come in and check your bed and he would open the drawers and if you didn't have all your shirt folded properly and if all your shirts weren't hung up right and your pants hung up right, then everything came out in the middle of the room in a pile and you got to do it again. Okay. Um, my dad taught us to stand at attention and, and he, he trained us much like he did the recruits that he trained in the military. Okay. Um, my dad admitted when I had kids and actually when my kids had kids, my dad admitted he didn't really like kids. Well, duh. <laughs> Anybody that knew you could tell. I mean, mom used to put us in bed at 6.30. You know how miserable it is to go to bed while there's still five hours of sunlight? And all your friends are outside playing pickle on the side of the house? Oh, Ben Notes! Oh, Ben Notes! And then Daddy come by and say, why are you standing looking out the window? Get in bed. Okay? Now, my mom came to salvation when I was six. Okay? Um, my dad did not get saved until I was almost 16. And one of the things that drove my father to God was the fact that my mom had peace and he had none. Okay? My dad was given to uh, fits of rage. Uh, when he was upset, he would often be physical. Now, now, I can choose to sit here and tell you story after story after story of the miserable, lousy, rotten things my dad did. But when I was 19, something happened. Um, the extent of my daily conversations with my father up to that point was, <coughs> how are you? How was your day? Good night. That was it. That was all we said. Now, I know you guys don't believe it, but I didn't talk a lot when I was growing up. I didn't actually start talking a lot until about the time I came to this church. Thank you very much. It's your fault. <laughs> um, my dad talked even less than I did. So out of a house of seven people, Two of us didn't talk, five talked incessantly, okay? When I was 19, I had to go to the uh, base, the, the military base, to get some insulin supplies. And my mom was working, and so my dad said, well, I'll take you. Oh, how bad do I need insulin? <laughs> I knew it was going to be miserable because the base was 45 minutes away from home. That's 45 minutes of painful silence. Followed by several hours waiting for them to fill the script. And another 45 painful minutes home. And I was right. 45 minutes of on the way to the base was miserable. Both of us incredibly awkward at conversation. 
But we went, got right into the doctor. I mean, for a military base, I was in and out in 30 minutes. And we walked down to the, the PX to get the prescription. And there was nobody there. We walked right up, gave him our thing, walked to the next window, picked it up. Two hours. Thank God I'm saying two hours. I don't have to be here. 45 minutes, God. 45 minutes. I need 45 minutes. We're getting home. We get in the car. We start to drive out the base. My dad says, would it be all right if we stopped and saw your grandpa's grave? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. So we went over to the cemetery. Now, God was very carefully orchestrating things for me. Because growing up, my relationship with my dad was such that I concocted plan after plan after plan to kill him. And I had dreams of, of beating my father to death. And they were not nightmares. God was working things to change my heart and my thinking. Because my dad took me over to the cemetery. And as we were walking back to my grandpa's grave, my dad started sharing with me his life. Now, my dad didn't talk. My dad shared things with me that day he hadn't even shared with my mom. And I started to get a glimpse of this man who came from a broken home, whose mom did not like him because he reminded her of her ex-husband, who very early in life became the man of the house with the responsibilities but none of the honor who uh, was broken from a very early age, broken. And he had no idea how to relate to kids. And so he fell back on the one thing that gave him any kind of training, any kind of guidance, and that was the military, that was the Navy. And he raised his kids as best he could with the limited resources that he had. Now you add all of that together with somebody that does not know God. And my dad did an incredible job. My dad did a fantastic job. Um, Tell him Happy Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> so what God started to do in me that day was apply this verse. He started showing me the honorable and commendable and true things about my father. He started showing me how he viewed my dad. And all of a sudden, the dreams weren't there anymore. All of a sudden, when my siblings would start to get upset with my dad, I was the one that was speaking peace. I was the one saying, no. No, you're, you're looking at just a small part of this. Now, don't get me wrong. My dad and I still had flesh. We still had instances and times where we would get ugly with each other. I look back on those now in shame. So when I tell you that we need to apply this verse, I'm not speaking just to blow air. Okay? I know some of you have had terrible relationships with your dad. I want to give you hope. And I also want to charge you with the responsibility that God esteems your father. How can we do less? I can fix that. <laughs> God, I was just trying to drum up business for you. We're in church. We're in church. I'll talk to him. <laughs> Did anybody else get visions of Charlie Brown adults right there? <laughs> Some of the things
things that happen in other churches, that's nothing. <laughs> See, we get to choose what we will dwell on. What we will focus our thoughts, what we will spend our time allowing to dwell in our minds and in our hearts. This is a directive, a commission from God to us. Take captive every thought. Take control of it. You can determine whether you will dwell with the mindset of sin. Sin's done to you. Thereby propagating that sin because you then increase your own sin because you will not forgive. See, by the measure you forgive, you are forgiven. Now, I don't believe that to be a salvation <coughs> issue. I believe that to be a quality of life issue. You can ruin your Christian walk with unforgiveness. Okay? God has called us to be in this world, but not to be of this world. We have got to reject the mindset that this world wants to give us on relationships. We've got to reject what this world tells us, this is as good as it gets. Okay? We've got to reject this idea that it's all about me. And start accepting the responsibility that God has given me. One of those responsibilities is that I have to have a right understanding of my position before Him so that I can really grasp how great and marvelous and big His forgiveness and His grace is to me. You see, if I don't really grasp how much He has forgiven me, I will never understand how little I really have to forgive others. Do you understand that? You, you get what I said? I'm going to say that again. Okay, if you don't understand exactly how much God has forgiven you, you will never understand how little you have to forgive others. Okay? Are we going to allow the position of fatherhood to be devalued? What does God say about fatherhood? He implemented it. He established it. He ordained it. He created it. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Don't, don't go there. I'm going to read a couple passages. If you want the references after, come talk to me. This is the Ten Commandments. Okay? He says, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. This command, understand that word command, this is not optional. Okay? This is not something you get to debate with God about. God says, honor. <coughs> honor them. But he also gives a promise. And it's, it's ironic that, that in the Ten Commandments, this is the one that he gives a promise to. It says that you may live long in the land that he's giving you. Ephesians, Paul reiterates this, saying, honor your father and mother. And he says, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Matthew 15, 4. Jesus says, honor your father and your mother. Okay? Now Jesus, being God, who gave this command in the first place, is telling us again, honor your father and your mother. But he goes on to say something else. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. Whoa. Whoa. You catch that? God says, honor your father and mother. But he also says, 
If you revile them, guess what? You think God thinks this is an important issue? I think he does. Because I think God is establishing something that we need to learn to have a right relationship with him. Exodus 21, 17 says, Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Leviticus 29, 20, verse 9, says, For anyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood is upon him. See, so I look back now at the things that I thought about my father, and I was deserving death. Before God, I deserved death. I deserved to be punished because I violated what God has established and God has required. See, this is not some silly little thing that we can play about with. This is something we have got to grasp today. If you are dishonoring your father, you are grievously offending God. You understand that? If you are dishonoring the memory of your father, you are grievously offending God. Proverbs says, if one curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in utter darkness. Does that phrase sound familiar to you? Utter darkness? Jesus uses that repeatedly in the New Testament. They will be cast out into the utter darkness. Okay? The idea behind that is they are removed from God. Fathers, by the very position God has put them in, are worthy of honor. Now, the man that serves in that position oftentimes makes mistakes, oftentimes fails. But God and God alone has appointed him to that position. And that is worthy of respect. That is worthy of honor. Now, we can do like I did growing up. I went through and I looked at all the scriptures that dealt with how a father was supposed to behave. And I've marked them. Oh, dad needs this one. I, somehow or another, I never really got to the part where I was supposed to treat him. I would kind of blink over that. And, and then God did a role reversal on me and he gave me kids. <laughs> and all of a sudden, those verses became very important to me. <laughs> the other ones, not so much. I, I wanted to highlight all my kids' Bibles with black Sharpie. <laughs> Just kind of take those ones out. See, we have a, a, a problem in our reading of Scripture. We want to read scripture for Joe, not for me. Oh, Joe really needs this one. Not Joe. <laughs> not, not Joe with an E, because there isn't anyone in here with Joe with an E, right? <coughs> Joe E. Okay. We want to read it to shine light on others. We do not like reading it when it shines light on ourselves. One of the things that we have to do is read scripture specific to ourselves. When Scripture gives me a directive, when Scripture te speaks to me as a father, or Scripture speaks to me as a husband, or Scripture speaks to me as a pastor, I've got to pay attention. Those are the things that I need to focus on. That's my primary responsibility in the reading and the application of Scripture. Okay? Secondarily, I read to be an encouragement to others. You see, we, we reverse those. We want to read scripture for everybody else and only be encouraged ourselves. Okay? I, I tend to be, um, <clears throat> Christy loves the Psalms, I love the Proverbs. Christy loves John, I love James. Okay? 
I tend to like things in black and white. There's the line. Don't cross it. Christy loves to dwell in the love of God. I don't even comprehend it a lot of times. Okay, I, I struggle with understanding God's love. I don't have a problem understanding his authority. I don't, under, I, I don't get a lot of times his love. God, I blew it. Boy, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I blew it. I was at a point on Tuesday where Christy said, are you praying? And I said, I don't want to pray right now because I don't want to hear what he'll tell me. I know I'm wrong, and right now, I want to be wrong because I'm bad. Uh, you all been there. <clears throat> we have to start reading Scripture in light of what it says to us. If you are reading Scripture to dictate how other people should act, you're missing the value of what Scripture has for you. You're missing God's written word to you. See, God wrote this for me. God always wrote scripture primarily for the me. So when you pick it up, you're the me. And he wrote it for you. But when I pick it up, he wrote it for me. And it's amazing to me how many times I'm reading scripture and something jumps right out of the page and slaps me upside the head. One of those things that I, that, that I, I read through Proverbs every month. Um, this year I've, I've dedicated to each day of the month I read that particular proverb. Okay? And, and I'm, some of the things that I, I, I've read Proverbs, I don't even know how many times before, but some of the things that God's showing me this year um, about how I'm a fool. Okay? And you understand what fool means in the Old Testament, right? Fool doesn't mean somebody that's just silly or, or stupid. A fool is somebody that has no moral compass. Okay? They're, they're lost morally. And when I start reading some of the things that I do, and I realize God opens my eyes to just how lost I am morally in some areas of my life, that can lead you to despair, but it shouldn't. It should lead you to hope, because His grace has covered that. When I came to Him... And I laid my life down. He knew that part of my life was sin. I didn't. I had no clue that what I was doing was grievous to him. That was an offense to him. And he forgave that anyway. It was covered. It was covered at Calvary. See, that, that's one of the things that's so dangerous about sin is it's, it's, it's so insidious. Oftentimes it's right in front of us and we don't even recognize it. But this reveals it. God's spirit that opens this and defines this and lives inside of us and prompts us. What was one of the purposes of his spirit? To convict the world of sin. Okay? Now, I want to caution you here. Because Satan likes to play that game too. Satan wants to condemn you because of your sin. You've got to watch where this is leading you. Because conviction can very easily turn into condemnation. And if it's something that makes you not want to go into the presence of God to receive His forgiveness, that's not God's Spirit. Okay? That's the devil trying to pull you away from God to minimize your authority and power, to restrict you, to keep you bound up, but God's Spirit convicts you. When God's Spirit convicts you, He also empowers you to have victory over that sin. John says we all stumble. No, James says we all stumble in many ways. Okay? Every one of us. We trip, we fall. Okay? That should be nothing new. But when you fall and your face is in the dirt... If that voice tells you that's where you belong, it's a lie straight from Satan. Because God says, when you humble yourself before me, I will lift you up. 
And oftentimes it takes us falling and getting our face in the dirt for us to realize just how proud we were. Okay? I'm going to back up. Got a little off track here. The point of this is, when we read Scripture, you cannot help but see the value that God has placed on fathers. He esteems fathers. He has ordained and called fathers. He calls fathers to account. <clears throat> he has established the family order such that it needs fathers. They have to be there. If they're not there, it doesn't work the way God designed. Now, if they're not there, you are not without hope. Because ultimately, God is all of our perfect Father. We're all brothers and sisters before Him. I think that's why over and over and over again in Scripture, God is so faithful to look after the needs of the orphans and the widows. And He requires us to look after the orphans and the widows. Because something's broken, something's missing, something has been taken away from there, that God intended to be there. And so he needs us to step up and look after the needs of the orphans and the widows. I have five biological children. I cannot count how many adoptees we have. I, I can't even tell you how many kids call me dad. But some of them with kids of their own now. God has called us men men, men, to be fathers, sometimes biologically, always spiritually. Always spiritually. Look around you. Some of you guys have stepped up and been fathers to my kids in areas that I couldn't. Some of you have set examples for them. Some of you have gotten involved in their lives. And I thank you for that. I thank you that God has made up for my lack. I have had the privilege of being able to step into some of your kids' lives and be able to bless them. And i got to tell you, guys, in this church we have some awesome, awesome fathers. And I can point out to you the awesome fathers because they have awesome kids. Awesome kids. I see a whole bunch of them sitting right over here. I see more of them in the back row. I see some over here. I see some. I'm getting there. <laughs> there was one over here. But pride goeth before the fall. <laughs> Everywhere I look in here, I see the result of God working in families. Amen. I see the result of God moving in answer to prayers. I see the result of people being set up and established to work on his behalf. I'll tell you, one of the fruits that I look for in a healthy church is not the number of people attending. I look at the number of people serving. I don't just look at the number of people serving in the body. I look at the number of people serving outside the body. And this generation coming up, I'll tell you what, we owe a lot to our youth leaders. Okay? Because they're teaching them responsibility both inside the church and outside the church. They're taking them out to do community service projects. They're taking them out door to door. They're going witnessing out on first Fridays. They're helping those inside the church. They came, the, the youth group came over to my house on Tuesday. I, honestly, I don't know how many tons of rock they moved, but they worked and worked and worked moving rock for me. Never a complaint. We had lunch. Okay, guys, time to get back to work. I turned and looked. Half of them were already walking off to work. The other half were talking about video games. <laughs> so long as you let them talk about video games, they'll do just about anything. <laughs> and with pizza. Pizza. Pizza helps. 
Pizza's like a, a, an inner energy builder. So I, I want to commend you men. Some of you do not have biological children. But I, 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 not to embarrass by any means, but I look at Matthew, who has spoken into the lives of several of my children. And they look at him and they, they see Christ modeled in his life. And I hear my kids talk. And Dennis, the wisdom that he, he shares, and some of the men at the brothers' meeting, and when my kids got old enough to start coming to the brothers' meeting, and their, their world was expanded, and they got to share in some of the wisdom of the men of this church. Uh, Christopher still misses brothers' meeting. Just about every time we talk, he asks what's going on in the brothers' meeting. I want to commend you men in this church. God has called you to a very high calling, and you are stepping up. You are stepping up and you are modeling Christ just as he has called you to do. So, fathers, today I commend you. Father, I thank you. Father, for the men in this church. Father, for the call you have placed on each of their lives. For the heart that you've given them. Father, for their willingness to do as you called. To respond to your call. And I ask, Lord God, that you would open our eyes today, that we would honor our fathers as never before. Father, that we would honor the fathers in our midst as never before. Help us to be a blessing to them. And Father, let them feel your joy even now. We bless you, we thank you, we honor you today because you are the example. You are the perfect example. You love us with a never-ending love. You are steadfast. You are faithful. You are always by our side. You are always ready when we call. We thank you and we honor you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.